Happy Sabbath. It is awesome to see you here. I'm glad you're here for you, Sabbath. And without anything else, I want to dive right in. The sermon is not done yet. Right? Which is what some of you will probably think when it hits 1 o'clock. You'll be like, oh, the sermon is not done yet. So bear with us. The feeling of something that you enjoy, when it ends, is usually not good. You know, whether it's you know, a TV series that, that you've been watching and it ends, or, or a good book that is finally closed up, or that last piece of cheesecake. When over or finished becomes a reality, many times it brings various emotions, but none of those things carry more weight than when we apply that ending to life. Many of us have lost loved ones, pets, friends, or even family. In that context, words like end and over carry a crushing burden. And we know that this is the reality on this earth. Sin has decimated what was once a thriving, beautiful planet and has placed a curse on all who live here. Curse to suffer, curse to die. We can do our best to extend our lives. We can eat clean, exercise, go to church, hold off from smoking or drugs. But our reality here in this life is that this life is not promised. A drunk or sleepy driver, any one of the numerous diseases, and sometimes it isn't even the usual cases that hit us. According to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, around 90 people are killed annually by riding one more. But in a Christian life, physical death doesn't mean the end. In 1 Thessalonians 4.13, it tells us not to mourn like those who do not have hope. Instead, we sing praises and lift their worship to a God who conquered death. Here we read about a Savior who Satan couldn't hold in the grave. Death has no chance in the fight against God of the universe, who said that one day at the last trumpet that he would come down himself and raise the dead. Our eternal physical life is directly connected with our spiritual relation to God. You've heard of stats. Our youth are becoming more and more spiritually disconnected. Even on a broader scale, a real practical relationship with Christ is less and less common. So the question is, what do we do? We look to Jesus, and we look at him in his Bible. Open your Bibles with me to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. That's where we'll be spending basically the whole sermon. John chapter 11, starting in verse 1. It reads, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Those are words that we never want to hear. And those are words that spring us into action. I think back just a few weeks ago, um, it was, it was actually on my birthday, I got a call late in the evening from my brother saying, Kevin, mom is in the hospital. Can you come? She had been dealing with foot issues and an infection in her foot had caused her to have been weakened and ended up with a 40 degree fever and very frail. Obviously, I drove there immediately. But Jesus waited. Verse 6 says, So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. Why would he wait? In hindsight, we understand, but it must have been odd for the disciples that he seemed so nonchalant about one of his closest friends. And in many of the situations we go through, it can feel like Jesus has heard about our struggle, but it's almost as if he's ignoring us. It almost seems like he doesn't really care. But that's not true. He does care. And we see in the story that he cared about Lazarus too. And then... Well, verse 7 reads, And then said to his disciple, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said a short while ago, The Jews there tried to stone him. And yet you are going back? Someone who didn't care wouldn't have put 
himself harm's way to be there. And he just shows us the first lesson in holding onto our youth. Sometimes ministering to us will not be convenient. For Jesus, it meant travel. It meant danger. It meant stepping out and going to where Mary and Martha were. Jesus didn't tell them to bring Lazarus to him or even send one of his disciples to him. Jesus made that journey. And as much as we don't like to admit it, we too need to make that journey. I saw a picture of a man standing under a sign that looked like this. For those of you that can't see it, it says, be who you needed when you were younger. And it brings to mind a famous quote that says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Which in simpler English means, Treat others the way you want to be treated. Jesus said those words. And I realized that I would not be here as your pastor at Willowdale Church if it were not for all of those certain people who made that journey in my life. And at the time, you know, when I really stopped to think about it, I didn't appreciate it. All of the rides, all of the food, all of the listening, all of the advice, all of the effort. Honestly, it was lost on me. But one day it clicked. It clicked how big an impact those people had in how I saw the church and what type of person I wanted to be. And looking back, I wish I had let them know that I appreciated them sooner. But as youth, we don't have to do these same things. We deal with each other all the time, and we know that sometimes we can be difficult. It's a two-way street. We can encourage those who spend so much time trying to encourage us. We can show them that what they do matters. And that we understand and appreciate the inconvenience. Being thankful in all areas of our lives is important. But in this case, it goes a long way. Those people helping us are usually just as busy or stressed as we are. But they're there. They show up. Jesus showed up even though there was danger. Here was his response to the threat. Verse 9-11 reads, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, but they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, but they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I am going there to wake him up. We knew that Jesus knew that Lazarus was dead. And he even says it on later in verse 15. But he's still going there. Jesus wasn't afraid because he knew that he walked in the light. Sometimes, you know, we get scared of what people are going to say. We are unsure if we can stand up to God because doing that might get us exposed. We're called to walk in the light. We're called to be the light. When our light reflects Jesus, it gives us confidence to share that gospel. A big reason why as denomination, we're ineffective reaching youth is because we don't show that light. Adults have been shown that Jesus living in us has made us kinder. Has it, in, has it made us more loving? And do we show that joy in the way we interact with each other, even when we don't agree. Youths and young adults have been shown a light following Jesus is better than what the world offers. Remember, Pastor Jake's sermon a couple weeks back, the big light of the Bible and the headlamp from the Bible that we take with us. Are we bringing the light that we're taking from the Bible and Jesus along with us in our daily lives? Because many times, what someone will believe about God will be based on what they see from who's representing him. Speaking of his representatives, as a disciple, it must have been a wild ride following Jesus. Thomas, who's known for his doubting nature, says in verse 16, let's go with him so we can all die together. This seems crazy. Not just because of the risk of the bodily harm, but also it was a wild ride because they probably spent most of their time confused. Jesus is like this really smart guy on every TV show 
that uses this weak statement that no one gets, but Jesus only gets it. And we see how this and the disciples, they're always trying to figure out what he's talking about. If you look at verse 14 15, after he has said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Verse 13, Jesus had been speaking of his death, but the disciples thought he meant natural sleep. And verse 14 goes on saying, and then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And at this time, the disciples, they're probably so confused. They're like, so you're telling me we're going back to Judea, where they're trying to kill you, but it's okay because we're going during the daylight? And Lazarus is sick. But you don't want to disturb his rest. Okay, now he's dead. But did you say he would have died? Had we waited, we're going to head there now. When he's already dead? What's going on, Jesus? Have you ever asked that? It ever came into your mind, just, uh, Jesus? I'm not really seeing the plan here. It seemed like we were going this way, and the logical direction would be this way, and now you're taking me over here. I'm a little confused. And you made all these great promises of more abundant life in John 10.10, 10, or you keep me safe in Psalm 23, or that you wouldn't give me more than I could handle in 1 Corinthians 10.13, but I'm struggling. I'm still hurting. I'm broken. I don't get it. The disciples heard Jesus say, this won't end in death, and seven verses later, he tells them that Lazarus is dead. It's confusing. But we have to pay attention to what Jesus actually said in verse 4. He says, this won't end in death. He never said that Lazarus wouldn't die. Max Lucado writes, God never said the journey would be easy, but he did say that the arrival would be worthwhile. Never said the journey would be easy, but the arrival would be worthwhile. So many young people have left because they lost sight of that big picture. They forgot that the abundant life does not always mean abundant stuff. That God's protection sometimes is simply from the second death, and that the only burdens we're able to carry is when we ask God to help us lift. We get caught up in the here and now, and the magnitude of our situation makes our view of these promises shallow. When we don't feel like we're getting that comfortable, pain-free, blessed life following God, we try and find it somewhere else. Misinterpretation leads to misdirection. But with all that said, Jesus still makes his way to Bethany. Let's read verse 17 to 21. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, verse 19. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them from the loss of their brother. When Jesus, when Martha, sorry, heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. By the time Jesus got there, Lazarus had been dead for four days. According to John 10, verse 40, Jesus was about a day's travel away from Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan in the area of Korea. He waited two days, and by the time he got there, Lazarus had been in the grave for four days. Meaning that most likely by the time the messenger got to Jesus, Lazarus had already died. Those four days are important. According to the Jewish Midrashic tradition, the person's soul hovered over the dead body for about three days. And with much simpler pra medicine, medical practices, it wasn't uncommon for someone who they thought was dead to wake up. So by delaying, 
Jesus made sure that there couldn't be any question about what he was about to do. After four days, no one could discredit the resurrection. Jesus was about to come, and he needed the setup to be just right. Martha meets Jesus before he gets to the house, and the statement she opens with more is more of a question. It says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In other words, Jesus, why didn't you come sooner? Your brother will rise again. You can tell by her response in verse 24 that she didn't realize that he was speaking literally, but Jesus kept talking, verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? This is the truth of gospel. Life is found in Jesus, and even Satan cannot take it from us when we accept God's offer. That is why, just like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 says, we do not mourn like those who have no hope as we struggle through school, through work, through the pressures of this world. We have to keep this. Wow. Mary's reaction to Jesus is similar to Martha's. As she actually leads with the same statement that Martha had. But as she enters the scene and the story continues, it gives an awesome glimpse of Jesus. In verse 33 to 35, it reads, When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And in verse 35 it says, Jesus wept. Two words. The shortest words in the Bible with some of the biggest impact. He saw the hearts of the sisters and he knew they were broken. He was about to perform one of the greatest miracles in his ministry. In a few minutes, he was going to make their crying end and bring happiness he never experienced before. But in that moment, he felt for them. Sin is a human condition. Everyone there, one way or another, deserves to die. Lazarus was a sinner. He was an innocent. But that didn't stop Jesus from caring. He could see the hurt, and the Bible says it moved him in his spirit, and it troubled him. Empathy. We need empathy. According to the New York Times, the U.S. suicide rates tripled for girls aged 10 to 14 between 1999 and 2014, compared to a 24% increase across all demographics during that same time period. According to research, young adults have a high risk of depression and anxiety. I've watched in the last year as multiple celebrities who had it all committed suicide or opened up to the media about their struggles with depression. Our youth are constantly bombarded out there with these fake lives that seem so glamorous and make them feel inadequate. Young adults look at the state of our economy and feel helpless, weighed down with their student loans starting like tens of thousands of dollars in debt before even entering the workforce. Relationships fail as we're still trying to figure out who we are. An immense pressure from families to live up to cultural standards has left many of our youth pursuing careers that they find no joy in. I'm not saying that we're innocent. We find ourselves in situations that we create for ourselves, and a lot of times we know that. But we need to see that you care. Weep with us. Romans 12 verse 15 tells us to mourn with those who mourn. Jesus knelt down with Mary before he told her to sin no more. He filled a net with fish before he said, follow me. And he wept before he raised Lazarus. Speaking comes after listening. Advice comes after understanding. I'm not saying that that will fix everything. At the end of the day, each person makes their own choice. And you can do everything right. You can be the best person in their life. And they can still choose to walk away. But what it does do is it shows that caring and compassion is found in the church. And even if that person doesn't accept it, other people see it. And by you expressing that to them, someone else might feel safe coming to us later. 
The reality is, our youth are going to go somewhere when they are in need. Let's make sure that that somewhere is right here. At the tone, it is time for Jesus to reveal his plan. Everything he has said would make sense with his upcoming action. Verse 39, take away the stone, he said. Things are about to get real, but not everyone is on board. Verse 39 40, but Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you do, you will see the glory of God? You know, sometimes our good intentions can get in the way of divine intervention. I'll repeat that again. Our good intentions can get in the way of divine intervention. Martha wasn't trying to stop Jesus from working a miracle, but was trying to be thoughtful to those around her and sensitive to her own emotions. Our good intentions, even if they make sense at times, can guide us into trouble if we're not first looking for God for our guidance. Jesus had been waiting. It had been days, and now he was standing before the open tomb. Verse 43 to 44. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. The dead man, the lost brother, the life ended, was standing there in front of them. There are situations that seem hopeless. People that seem too far gone, spiritual lives that appear dead. But God can do what no one else can. God can create a world from the void. God can make flesh from dirt and make life from death. Make sure you're within God's will and then never give up. God is fighting for us, so we need to keep going. Don't stop praying for that loved one that left church. Don't stop being kind just because someone doesn't appreciate it. Don't tell God what the end is. It might not have been done yet. The person might say they're finished. But God doesn't work in human terms, and he's not limited by our narrow viewpoint. From the beginning of chapter 11, he knew what he was going to do. The people with him just needed to follow the plan. And we need to follow the plan. Jesus doesn't actually need us to accomplish his goal. But the cool thing about Christ is that he wants us to be a part of his plan. Jesus could have told that rock to move and it would have rolled away. But instead, he made the humans there do it. Jesus could have commanded the angels to unwrap Lazarus, but he made the people there do it. God wants us to be involved in the process. He wants us to experience the joy of seeing a life restored of seeing a relationship with Jesus grown and developed. He wants us to be a part of the victory. We don't do the resurrecting. All the glory still goes to God. But we get to be a part of the celebration. I want to spend a little time on the idea of unwrapping. A few years ago, Pastor Habit Williams from Andrews University Seminary was main speaker for the youth section at camp meeting. She brought up the importance of the task of unwrapping. She compared it to the responsibility we have as Christians to help people as they lead their sinful life and begin their journey of Jesus. She told her conversion story. Accepting Jesus, she was baptized and became a member of her local church. A lady became her attending member, the person in charge of her unwrapping into this new life. When the woman visited her home, she was shocked to see that they had a hamster. She told Pastor Williams that rodents have no place in the home of a Christian and that she needed to kill it. She couldn't bring herself to kill her son's only pet. So, with tears in her eyes, she brought the furry guy downstairs and let him go outside of the apartment building. Her son was devastated. She reflected on that and realized how important it is that we represent Jesus accurately to those people who come into our church. We are unwrapping them so that they can live a new, abundant life with Jesus. 
not for our own opinion and cultural norms. But this especially applies to how we treat our youth who come back. How they responded to Lazarus at the grave would impact how quickly he got out of his grave clothes. If they had decided, no, you smell bad, and they stayed away, or they were afraid because he literally had been a corpse just a few minutes ago, he would have remained restricted and tied up, stuck in bondage. I remember my mom coming home one Sabbath angry. It was a Sabbath that my cousin, who was a young adult at the time, was visiting after a long period of wait. And I remember my mom telling me she couldn't focus on the sermon because all she could hear were the ladies talking in front of her. Oh, that's so and so. She doesn't actually go here. Do you see what she's wearing? Etc. Etc. I have an older brother and a younger brother. Neither of them are in the church. Both of them trace it back to being treated poorly by pastors and church leaders when they were about 13 or 14. My older brother would get yelled at. He did. He volunteered for AV, and he got yelled at because the pastor wanted the screen up by the time he started praying, but he was not allowed to have the screen in motion until the last word of the hymn had been sung. So every time after Sabbath, my brother would get yelled at. My younger brother was accused of something he didn't do. And then on multiple levels, was never allowed to actually tell the story, never allowed to have representation, and eventually was gossiped about by the local pastors so much that they labeled him a thug and assigned a deacon to watch him during service. He was a 13-year-old kid that someone had lied about. And it took years before people started to catch on with the family lying about him and lied about everybody else. But by then, it was too late. All this to say, years later when I became a pastor of that church, I, uh, I invited my younger brother to a gym night. And he came. But he didn't want to stay very long. Because he couldn't take the looks. He couldn't take the whisper. He's never been back. It takes strength and courage to come back to your home church after you leave. To know that people have been saying all sorts of things about you while you've been gone. And to know the scrutiny that's going to show up when you walk through those doors. How we respond to those who are dead and are coming back to life is not only experienced by the people that are returning. The youth that are here see it as well. And the reality is, how we respond will have a direct impact on whether they stay. What we see and hear, what they see and hear, will determine whether they want to be here. The father of the prodigal son said in Luke 15, verse 23, Let's have a feast and celebrate. But this son of mine was dead and is alive again. John 11 tells us, Lazarus was dead and Jesus brought him back. Luke 15 says that a sheep was lost and its shepherd went out and brought it back. So don't give up on us. Just because their church life seems dead doesn't mean that God can't bring renewed spiritual life. Amen. Make a journey. Feel for us. And celebrate those who Jesus gives in your life. But it's not a one-way street. And I want to challenge our youth and our young adults, and I see many of them in here. I want to challenge you to support your church as they support you. And for those that are here, and for those that want to say, you know what? I'm here. I'm at Willowdale. I want to be a part of this family, and I want to appreciate what the church will do for me. I want you to stand. If you're a youth young adult, you say, you know what? I want to build into this congregation, and I want to say I'm ready to become a part. I want you to stand. Now, for those of you whose youth might be a little past you, might be a little bit in the rearview mirror, if you want to stay, that you will use your experience, your compassion, and your time to be a blessing to our youth. If you want to tell our youth and young adults that we love you, you matter, and we are here for you, then I want you to stand as well. We can't do this alone. We need each other. We don't have to fit the narrative. We don't have to submit 
to numbers and statistics. Let's show the world what can happen when we allow God's power to move. He's not done yet, and neither are we. I invite you to remain standing as I call up our praise team, and we will sing the closing hymn, hymn number 287, Softly and Quiet. 